and welcome to Guess for Change. If you haven't watched our previous videos yet, I'm Michaela, one of the sustainability representatives for the guest list. Today on Guess for Change, we will be speaking with Lachine Fancé. For over a decade, he has served as a sustainability leader and lecturer in the private sector as well as high academic institutions. So there is this whole system and industries in place and perhaps it stop starts people. But I want to ask you, in terms of government and legislation, where do you think they come into this factor? Because I feel a lot of people feel that they can't get somewhere because the rest of the world is doing something else, the majority, let's say. So what would you say is the government's role? It, 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 can they bring about change or push us forward or are, are they hindering us? Well, Michaela, I, there, there's a couple of things that I'd lo love to unpack, unpack in, in what you're asking. But the first, let's let's talk about profitability. So um, we often, you know, I, I when I was in the corporate sustainability world, I would often say, you know, yeah, it's it's it's, it's really profitable to be sustainable. Um, and, and I, you know, as we really I mean, let's let's talk real talk. Not always. Um, there are aspects of sustainability and circularity that are more expensive. Um, and it's just what you said, it's someone's not getting paid or it's um, you cannot have a circular garment that is a low quality garment. Uh, and we have been trained to look only at the upfront, trained as, con as customers, as, as you know, really as consumers in that classic sense of the word, trained to just look at the upfront cost of something. It's five euro for a shirt. Instead of looking at the total cost of ownership. Maybe it's five euro for a shirt, but it's five euro for a shirt in two months when this shirt decomposes and you know um, disintegrates on my body because it's not well made, it's not high quality. It's made by someone who doesn't care and isn't getting paid for it. And so if you look at the total you know, cost of um, what I, even which is what I pay as, as a customer of clothing and the social and environmental cost. I mean, if we, don't pay our workers and then there are uh, disasters in that community and the community is not resilient for those you know to to those disasters and then our tax dollars go to helping that country i mean ultimately we pay in some sense right and so um, when we talk about profitability and circularity i will say you know sometimes it will increase your upfront costs because you need to uh, the world needs to start paying for high quality materials for research, for creating infrastructure. I mean, we saw that, you know, in Bangladesh during the, the Rana Plaza, you know, the, the horrible fire that we had there and subsequent realization that many of the factories there were, you know, had detrimental working conditions, they had unsafe conditions. We had to invest a lot in, in building up the infrastructure of that place. It's, it's not just Bangladesh, right? It's it's all over the world that we need to, you know, and, and it's it's one of the fundamental um, sustainable development goals is building up the infrastructure for, uh, you know, affordable uh, jobs and and um, being able to just survive and be resilient. So there's that piece of it that I think the world does need to invest in, and we as customers need to understand. Yes, I may pay more for my garments, but it is, you know, it's it's. I often say that sustainability and circularity off it always always have a positive return on investment. It's just a matter of how you define return and investment. If you define it only financially, then it may be negative in the short term. Um, but if you define it as, as the whole collective of financial, social, uh, and uh, environmental, and, and you know, just having a planet on which we can continue to do business, then it's always positive. That said, when you look at the long-term profitability, yes, some of your costs will go up, some of your costs will come down because you're reducing waste, you're reducing energy, reducing you reducing material scrap, et cetera, as you improve your practices. But there's something fundamentally more important, which is circularity requires a shift in how we relate to our customers. So as you sell a garment, if you're direct to consumer, as soon as it's fulfilled on your website, you put it in a box, you ship it away, or if you're you know, if you're, uh, your your channel is retail, you, you're, you're a wholesale, you know, you give it to a wholesaler, you give it to a, you know, send it to a distribution center. If it's out of sight, out of mind, you never touch that customer again. If you do, it's lucky because they've come back to your website because they've liked your product. But when you create a circular business and you say, you know what, this fabric that I've sent you or these this pair of sunglasses or this shoe 
I care about it. And I want to help you figure out what to do with it afterward or what to do with it while you own it. You're creating a deeper customer relationship. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Anton knows this, right? When, when he's launched the Cashmere Spa, what he knows is it may cost me a little bit more to service these garments over the course of the life, to extend their life for my customers. But what it costs me in upfront labor or materials, I get back paid you know, tenfold in deepening my relationship to my customer, in sharing my values with them, and in connecting with them on a, on a continuing basis to say, we care about the things we make, we wanna help you extend the life of the things we make. And by the way, we make other things that we also care about, and why don't you, you know, take a look at those? So it's, it's a matter of, of shifting from this model of just throwing, throwing seeds out in the world and hoping a few of them take to really caring about the things that we put in the world and showing customers that we care about them. And that is incredibly valuable and incredibly profitable. So the second, the second piece uh, is you talked about, about the government role. Uh, you know, Michaela, I, I, was, I was at uh, COP21, the, the, the UN Climate Change Conference in, in Paris in 2015, that was um, just a seminal moment. I mean, it was the first time that every country came together there's 196 countries signing the Paris Accord, uh, covering 97% of, of global emissions. And we came together to say, this is a crisis. This is a problem for the world and we need to come together to solve it. And what was really unique, you know, I, I, it's a whole nother, nother webinar to dig into the, the guts of the Paris Agreement, but the way it was different, just to, to, to really quickly review it, the way it was different from the preceding agreement, which was the Kyoto Protocol. Kyoto Protocol said, everyone's going to reduce, it's legally binding, here's how you're going to do it. Paris Accord said, no, we want you to tell us what is your individual national contribution to climate and to climate crisis. And so the US said, uh, we're going to um, start to, to reduce our, you know, coal fired electricity. India said, hey, you know, rural electrification is a huge barrier for us. Uh, to to social uh, improvement, we're going to keep you know increasing our our uh, our emissions because rural electrification is going to is going to cause that. But then we're going to peak and we're going to start reducing. You know, China said we're going to create the the world's biggest cap and trade program. So every nation had its own different individual contribution. And then as a whole, we looked at it and said, look, these are all going to lead to a three and a half or four degree temperature rise. We're going to ratchet all of those contributions up and say, everyone. Let's get together in a few years again and, and just and say, we got to be more ambitious. We got to do it. So it was really, it's a bottom up sort of individual uh, agreement that celebrates each country's contribution to, to climate and each country's unique way of contributing. And so I'm really hopeful that, and, and there's a lot of criticism about Paris in saying it's not giving us a two degree or even 1.5 degree that we need, um, but it is a mechanism. It is a, a a process and, and it's a commitment, it's a global commitment where countries are, are saying, we're all in this together, there's one atmosphere. And so, a, you know, a, a kilogram of carbon in South Africa is equal to a kilogram of carbon in the US because there's only one atmosphere that it's going into. And so um, as we move forward from that, I mean, Paris was five years ago, six years ago now. Uh, and so what we now have to ask is how do we translate each of those individual commitments to real change within each country. And so there's, there's a government sector that has a lot of responsibility for that. There are you know, social NGOs, um, you know, social organizations, civic society. Uh, there's individuals, individual citizens of, of the world that need to start looking at things like flight shaming you know, um, and, and flying less um, and understanding our contribution to, to climate, our individual contribution. And there's also companies. And so governments are, are one uh, of those stakeholders and a, and a really important one. Um, and so, um, I mean, if you look at it, you know, I'm, I'm American, if you haven't been able to figure that out from my accent, um, we in America have a, have a different view. Let, let's face it, we have a different view of, of government intervention, government interaction from that of Europe or that of India or that of China. We in the US put a lot more stock in innovation than we do in regulation. And so what we do is um, our, so if, if we as, as companies, as entrepreneurs fell back on 
whatever the US Environmental Protection Agency required, it would be not nearly enough. I mean, falling back on EPA regulations is like the bare minimum. You know, it's, it's basically don't poison the earth, but if you do poison it, just do it slowly, please, not too quickly. I mean, that's essentially what, what following EPA regs say. Um, but we value how do we innovate on, you know, moving forward and creating new models that are going to do, going to do things better. So for me in the US uh, and, and for 11 Radius and for, you know, the, the other organizations that I'm involved with, what we talk a lot about is um, regulating the rules of the marketplace. So for example, carbon pricing. So we look at if we can put a price on carbon, whether it's a carbon tax, whether it's a cap and trade. I mean, as, as Yogi Berra once famously said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. You know, I don't care what the, the regulation looks like, but that's not saying you need to build product this way. That's saying you can do whatever you want, but here's the price, here's the cost of what you're doing. And let's price that into the cost of doing business. So I mean, there are plenty of other regimes that, you know, the, the um, emissions trading scheme in Europe and, and uh, cap and trade, you know, between California and, and, and uh, Canada uh, that, um, that are um, doing uh, carbon pricing really well. Um, and, and a lot of different models that we can learn from, but that's one example of how um, we view leading with innovation more than leading with regulation. Now, it's not a, it's not a criticism of anywhere else in the world. I think in places that have strong regulations, that's great. And let's have them keep doing that because they're also showing us other ways of shifting society towards better solutions. And so I think it's gonna take just a whole collection of different ways of doing this. Uh, but that's that's kind of, you know, what I view as, as the American perspective. As you were saying, this light behind you was like shifting and you were like, the, all the countries are coming together. No, it was amazing. It was just like, listen to a sheen. It was fantastic. Like I couldn't, it's, it must have been such an amazing experience to be at Paris at the moment and just kind of being, feeling that energy of like, it's no longer about individual countries. It's now about the world. The world is being impacted and now countries, you have to figure out a way to solve this and do it maybe through innovation, do it through legislation, like you were saying. So it's just really awesome to actually hear positivity out of this because a lot of the media, we kind of very, perhaps only hear the negative out of it. Perhaps we hear people that are, don't believe in climate change and it just brings up all this frustration because it's happening in front of us. The natural disasters around us are not as natural as we may think. It's a reaction to what we're doing to the earth. Is there any other businesses that are kind of becoming like perhaps the forefronts in reaching the circular status? Because I know it's not perhaps something that's there. We don't know what it is. We're still testing and trialing, which is a really interesting phase in, our, in this entire period, because we all know there's a common goal and that's to reduce the climate, climate change completely is there something that stands out to you or people that you've spoken to that are just doing really amazing things? It'd be amazing to hear what they're doing. When we talk um, with, uh, you know, we talk with many um, fashion organizations with, uh, you know, with that are members or that are involved in the things that we're doing. And we often say, we're not promoting best practices because nobody knows the best practices yet. We're promoting practices. Some of them are great. Some of them we're trying and, and they might not work. And that's fine because, you know, when we're, we're reinventing the entire global economy, or, you know, from a linear model and from so many economies of scale and scope that have uh, been built into how we do this linear, uh, you know, pull something out of the ground convert it, you know, to a different form, sell it to someone and throw it back into a landfill or burn it even worse. Um, this, this, you know, the whole global economy is built for this. And so as we break that and, and make it circular, we're figuring that out. And so what we're seeing is, um, and I, you know, I, I think uh, Anton is brilliant at, at being on the forefront of this. What we're seeing is that brands are starting to say, I'm going to try something. And as I try it, I'm going to see if customers are interested in and if other brands are interested in. And if it's both, then perhaps I'm going to create this hybrid model of, yes, I'm a brand and I, and I produce something that I really value and care about. And, and hopefully a lot of people are interested in, in, in wearing it. But also I've created 
a, a service that is going to move circularity forward and, and move the industry forward. And that's also valuable. That's also something that I'm going to monetize, um, but also share. I mean, you know, the, the, the positive side of monetization is it's a way to prove that something works, right? And so, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about the Cashmere Spa and, and, and what Anton has created there uh, in, in saying um, there is value in looking to extend the life of garments. Um, there's, there's value to the consumer, there's value to other brands as well um, in, in taking actions to do that. Other examples that I've seen are, are in many cases, um, similarly, brands that are taking something that they have done for themselves and saying, you know, is this, is this reasonable for the rest of the world? So we're talking with, with a great um, pair of entrepreneurs in Egypt. Um, they have a brand called Scarabay. Uh, and uh, they are, I mean, May and Ali, this, this husband and wife team, they've worked for the UN, they've done lots of, of great social equity work. So they've created this streetwear brand from, um, you know, fair trade organic cotton from Egypt um, and, and from India. And what they realized is one of, one of the things, one of the many things that circularity um, and that the circular economy and fashion requires is high quality fabric that's kind of circulating through, uh, that has both a margin and the quality to be able to have multiple lives as it goes through the industry. And so they've sort of casually said, you know, yeah, as, as the, the rays of God and judgment shine upon me at the moment, sorry. Um, they, they've kind of said, you know, we have all these you know, connections to, to, to family farmers and, and different, um, you know, farmers in Egypt and, and increasing in India who are just producing really high quality cotton. You know, we use it, you know, in, in our own brand. And what we, you know, Monica and I, my, my co-founder with 11 Radius, we had the, a number of conversations with them where we said, you know, guys, this is, this is really something the world's looking for, you know, like let's spread it beyond your brand. And so they've, they've created a service to say, you know, we can connect you with, with, uh, high quality Egyptian cotton and Indian cotton, that's going to be a value in, in everything that you do. And so that's, you know, another example of like, let's take what we do and, and spread it to other circular brands, because it's not a matter of competing. It's a matter of collaborating um, in, in a pre-competitive sense, right? We talk a lot about pre-competitive collaboration, which is let's collaborate to create a better world and then compete under this, this really high bar of a standard. Um, so that's, that's a great example we have another entrepreneur that we're um, talking a lot with uh, named Eleanor Turner, who's created a brand called The Big Favorite. Actually, when I say created the brand, this is her great grandfather's brand. It's a heritage brand that she's she's um, uh, kind of repurposed into a circular brand. So she's doing um, circularity for undergarments, which is like, she's, and, and she says, if I can figure this out for undergarments, right? And what nobody wants to touch, literally, then I can figure it out for anything. And so what she's realized is, uh, brands are coming to her and saying, you figured out some things with, with the circularity of what you're trying to do and, and, and recollecting and doing things like, like monofiber using a certain, you know, um, high quality blend of cotton to be able to, to have, you know, to, to, to do um, mechanical recycling of it and, and to, to be reusing it in, in new, new threads. Um, because if, as you can imagine, peer-to-peer uh, -peer resale is not an option for undergarments, right? It's <laughs> like, you nobody wants to do that. <laughs> yeah, um, <that's> <laughs> <laughs> but you can certainly recycle and so and, and, and repurpose and upcycle. And so um, she's realized that other brands are interested in, in the methods that she's using and, and are coming to her and saying, hey, can you help me do this? Can we franchise what you're doing? Can we collect, you know, with you? And so that idea of, you know, understanding the supply chain that, you know, the, the, the monofiber and, and, and how to, to keep it in circulation is a practice that she's learning a lot about and that she can present to the rest of the world. Similarly, we're talking to a great brand uh, called Four Days, um, where the founder, Christy Kaler, has said, I want to test to see if my customers will pay for circularity. And so she's offered a, 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 a bag. She said, you know, pay me $10 as a brand. I will send you a bag, put whatever you want in there and send it back to me, my brand or any other brand, and I will figure out how to recycle it. And so, of course, there's all these questions that we have, you know, like, um, great questions about what's the back end and how do we do this and like what's the sorting and cleaning and separation and we're talking with a number of service providers that do all of those things the reverse logistics the cleaning the sorting the repair the um, mechanical recycling the chemical recycling all of this 
grand ecosystem has to come together to solve some of these problems. But some of these brands are saying, I don't know if there's an ecosystem for this. I'm just going to put it on my web page and offer it and see if anyone's going to pay me to discover the ecosystem. And, and if, if we need to build the ecosystem, and that's the kind of entrepreneurial, um, you know, step one, sell the t-shirt, step two, figure out how to make and recycle the t-shirt that we're trying to, to really promote. And so that's, it's, it's just an amazing time for circularity in that sense. A hundred percent. I mean, the future is collaboration, no longer competition. It's just something that rings so true because also what I've noticed is that people, especially joining 11 Radius when the guest list join, people are wanting to share their ideas, their innovation, their research. It's not a matter of this is mine. I want to keep it because I want to get a profit. It's like everyone needs to know what I found out because you need to be doing it. Can I help you? This is what I do. Can we maybe make an exchange? And I love what that what 11 Radius does and brings people together. It's just really a proactive way to just kind of push everything forward because we may never have met any of these people before. Like speaking to them in like some of those chat rooms like again I just completely nerded out because I had never heard of some of these brands and they're doing amazing things so you are in such a pivotal position to kind of bring everything together and I, I love everything that 11 radius is doing people are no longer competing and when you say that they're competing at a higher level they're then they kind of actually no longer doing the traditional ways. They're now putting themselves, setting the bars high and be like, okay, now we're ready. Now let's, who can make the best experience for their customer? Because at the end of the day, a well-made garment is not going to be gone. It's going to be repaired and it can just, the longevity of it is just so valuable and i love that you also bring always in the cashmere spa because that's what the guests is really focus on at the moment. it's just really really cool that we're taking it back to per perspective and be like listen we know you really love that nut in your cupboard that that's your grandmother's and it has so much memorabilia to it and value to it we want to prolong the life of it it's not something that you should ever give away and it's something that you should wear and not just sit in your cupboard so people like the guests well anton people <laughs> Anton, our magic man who makes this all happen. Um, it's just awesome to hear that the other business owners are trialing things. Yes, it may cost them a little bit more, but they, they don't have profits at heart. They have ethics. They have the love for the environment, love for their customers. It's no longer just a face value of here's your product, enjoy it. Tell us, tell us what you like, tell us if we can improve and also bringing it into transparency and be like, we're not there yet. We're not fully circular. And this is also a guess for change. Just kind of admitting that we want to learn more. This is why we want to talk to you. And this is why I also asked who you've been talking to, because perhaps we can get them on here as well, guess for change and just chat to them because there's just so much insider thing and I actually envy your job to be honest to be <laughs> to meet all these people and just have conversations sipping tea and just having a great time and just being so inspired because you come with just this really positive approach like it's getting there we're doing it because if like sometimes you can just be so channeled in especially algorithm and social media and if you tap into one algorithm you can be channeled into all the negativity and you think the world's gloom and doom but on the other hand there's always another side to the coin on the other side of the coin people there are people like yourself people that are you're involved with are actually making these steps forward and it's just it's honestly awe. i'm just in awe and as this light hits you i'm just like oh. <laughs> Like, it's fantastic. And I, I really just love speaking to you. And I definitely think another time we're going to have another interview with you. Wow. I mean, I, if, if we didn't have to go over time, I, like I said at the beginning, I could chat to you for hours. <laughs> um, same, same. And what, you, what you guys are doing is, is wonderful. I mean, um, you, you also get to work with some really great uh, other brands that are doing incredible things and and you know this this world of fashion and circular fashion is uh is is a complex one but one that has to evolve and is evolving and it's just wonderful and and what a great opportunity for us to be at the forefront of that evolution i am just really happy that i came across 11 radius and the guest list joined and since then it's just been nowhere but up um it's honestly been amazing talking to you 
uh, Ashin, wow, just I, I can literally the sun, the everything that you're saying, there's a fire in my belly. I just want to like go outside and be like, we're doing it. There is change. There is hope. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's let's get out there and do it. Absolutely. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Ashin. I love the positive attitude. Thank you so much, Michaela. This is a lot of fun.